Number one, first, I'm grateful to be here. This is a, Utah State for me was a, was a really formative time. My background, which I'll talk about a little bit, I grew up in a very, very small town in Idaho. It's called Ryrie. Anyone from Ryrie here? No, no one's from Ryrie here, okay. Um, once in a while it happens. Um, and, uh, and didn't know anything about business uh, at all. In fact, I probably couldn't have spelled business when I started at Utah State. Um, and uh, had a really great experience. I'm going to talk about some of those experiences here. And actually, there's a, a and have a little, I'll have a little shout out later. We have a, we have a special guest here. Um, but we'll get started. Uh, so here's kind of how we're going to go today. And we'll have a little bit of Q&A at the end. But we'll start out with like, what the heck is Bercadia? So when I told my grandmother, who now is 95, I told her, I said, hey, grandma. And, or she was, we were talking. And she said, where are you working at? I said, I'm now working at a place called Bercadia. She said, is that a blood disease? <laughs> and I said, no, it's not a blood disease. So there, for those of you who think it may be a blood disease, we're going to clear that up a little bit. Uh, talk a little bit about kind of, you know, my journey, where I started from and kind of how I went. It's kind of a, a fun little uh, story. Uh, and then lessons learned along the way. And then we'll get to kind of a Q&A and hopefully there are lots of, uh, lots of questions. I, I can stand up here and, and go on for a long, long, long time, but it's way more interesting if there's something that you're interested in. And maybe some of the stuff we talk about uh, will, will spark someone else. So, Bercadia. So Bercadia is, a, is, a, is an intermediary company. So we play in the commercial real estate space, and we really have three distinct lines of business, although I'm going to tell you kind of the, the secret sauce of the whole thing. Um, one division is investment sales. And what investment sales is, think about this as, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to think, Remax, I guess, maybe, uh, you know, a bro for apartment buildings. So we try to get listings. We try to get people who own apartment buildings, who own hotels, who own other commercial real estate. We try to get them to allow us to list their buildings, and then we run a process and we sell those buildings for them, right? So that's investment sales. And in 2018, we did about $8.5 billion of that business uh, across the United States. The second division of the business is mortgage banking. Mortgage banking is when you have someone who buys an apartment building, who owns an apartment building, or some other form of commercial real estate. That could be retail, industrial, office, self-storage. I mean, anything that's kind of outside of the residential space will actually kind of match you up with the right lending partner for you. So maybe you want to hold it for a short term. Okay, well, we're going to match you up with a debt fund or something along those lines. Maybe you want to hold it super, super long time and it's a housing asset. That could be a HUD loan that's a 35-year loan. I mean, there's all sorts of kind of different flavors, and our job is to figure out what's going to work best for you, and we're going to kind of arrange and make sure that everything happens so that you can get access to that debt as you're trying to buy different, uh, different assets. That's kind of one version of the, That's one, one side of our business. And in 2018, we did about uh, $26 billion worth of debt originations across the country uh, for those, about 70% of which was multifamily, so we're big in the apartment space, but we also do all the other um, asset types as well. And then the third, uh, the third kind of leg of the stool is servicing. So once we originate a mortgage, you know, it's a, usually the, in, in real estate, those are typically 10-year mortgages, we service them. So that means we get the cash flow that comes in from the payments, we make sure those go out to the investors, right? We make sure the, that all of the um, properties stay in compliance with their loan covenants. It's a very much a, a hands-on, very kind of detailed process side of the business. Uh, we have about, I have to look now, 1,900, oh my gosh, okay, like 200 more have been hired since I looked at this. Um, we have about 1,900 employees, 800 of which are located in Hyderabad, India, um, and they're doing a lot of the back office stuff, particularly around servicing, but they also were more and more every day finding ways for them to help us on the front end, which is kind of the sales process. So that's kind of the technical way that I would describe kind of Bercadia, but the, the way that I describe it in kind of common language is, we have 350 eat what you kill salespeople. That's kind of what my day, people ask, what do you do during your day? Well, I, I work with 350 salespeople who if they, they don't get the next deal, they don't eat. And so they're very, very aggressive and very, very energetic and excitable and, and uh, crazy and uh, all the other adjectives that we could kind of use there. And then we have all the stuff behind it that kind of helps, helps support them. That's what Bercadia is. Just to give you a little bit of background about how it came together, so uh, back in, uh, in, you know, in the olden days, uh, none of you guys were born during this time, I'm sure, uh, or most of you weren't, there was, a there was a big company called GMAC, part of the GM General Motors family. Um, and they started a business called GMAC Commercial Mortgage, or GMAC Mortgage, and we're doing kind of the business I'm talking about, our, our mortgage banking side, right? And they kind of ran that through from 1985 through 2006, and then they carved off a piece of that, the commercial mortgage part of it, because they were also doing residential mortgages, 
And they sold that to a few geniuses that were walking around on Wall Street. Maybe you've heard of them, Five Mile Capital, Goldman Sachs, KKR, all of kind of the bright lights of, uh, of, the, of the investment banking world and, and, and investment world. And they said, we have this great idea. We're going to take this little business, which was you know, rather small at the time. We're going to pump a bunch of money into it. And then in 2009, we're going to do an IPO, and we're all going to get rich. So that's kind of a, 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 a recipe that you see a lot, or certainly saw a lot then. And so who knows what happened in 2008? How many people were alive? In, no, I'm just kidding. But 2008, right? When uh, 2008, we have the Great Financial Recession. And especially hard to hit were kind of the financial areas, and, and particularly in liquidity. And in our business, liquidity, that means that money's flowing back and forth. It's the lifeblood. And as soon as that shuts off, like the world comes to an end. So this brilliant thing, which was called Capmark by these guys, was built up, built up, built up. And when the liquidity shut off, it blew apart. It was spectacular. It blew up, went into bankruptcy, uh, and, uh, and sat in bankruptcy for a while as they were kind of trying to work through what was left. And we stumbled upon, and I'll talk a little bit about my background, the two companies that you see, Berkshire Hathaway and Lucadia, we stumbled upon Capmark in bankruptcy. And we said, this is kind of an interesting business. It was a weird time. This was 2009, so the world was still on fire. There was still not a lot of liquidity in the, in the space. And we said, man, this would be an interesting asset to get a hold of if we can. Went through a, a very long process, uh, which is, uh, and I also learned a lot about uh, some things. Bankruptcy, if you want to be the most powerful person in the world, be a bankruptcy judge. There's like no appeal, there's no, you know, when you walk into the room, he is the king of his world or she is the king of her world and there you have no, there's nothing you can do about it. And some of them are very interesting characters because of that. Um, and Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Warren Buffett's company obviously, and then our company, which I was with Lucadia, we came together and we bought Catmark out of bankruptcy. And because we're kind of cheap, we decided not to hire a marketing firm to figure out our brand name. So we just took the Burke from Berkshire Hathaway and the Adia from Lucadia and we shoved them together and called it Burkadia. Um, we'd done in my, in my life, uh, I, I worked at Lucadia for 14 years, we'd done a couple of deals with Warren, so we kind of had a familiarity, and when it came together, he allowed us to kind of borrow part of his name and borrow some other things that we'll talk about a little bit. And in 2009, we emerged as a company called Burkadia, and we had a great big servicing book of about $220 billion, and we had a little teeny production outfit that was doing about $2 billion a year of originations. So you can see from kind of 2009, 2010 to 2019, we've grown kind of astronomically and that's really been because we've had such a great economy. Uh, really low interest rates, lots of capital that have been kind of headed for our business. So exciting, uh, 2009, whoops, I should have clicked through that. I like that. I, don't, I didn't do this, but that's pretty cool. Turn those into that, that's for Katie. Someone in our marketing department. So I thought I'd tell, uh, obviously our partners, Warren Buffett, and one of the things I saw, I saw something about me coming to speak, and one of the, one of the sub, subtitles was like, you know, frequently, or uh, uh, what was it exactly? It was something about he works closely with Warren Buffett. And I thought, man, someone in the Utah State Marketing Department should get a medal for this, <laughs> because that may be the greatest piece of puffery I've ever seen. Um, a more accurate way of saying it would be, you know, interacts once in a while with Warren Buffett would be a, a far better thing. But I will tell you kind of an interesting story. And, and um, we had, we bought Burkadia and from 2009 to 2014, I'd hired a CEO to run Burkadia and, and, uh, and then I became CEO in 2015. I'll talk about that. But we had a, a retreat where we brought in all of our management. So all of our management of Burkadia and we called, uh, actually I called, uh, but Warren and said, would you come and talk to our management team? He's like, yeah, so, you know, I'll come, but I, I have to be back. I'll come on Saturday, but I got to be back Saturday night because Sunday I have a bridge tournament and I'm not missing my bridge tournament. Okay, great. So this was a, this was a funny year. This was um, in his annual report the, the, the year before he had actually said something. He said, anyone who has a private aircraft, it's called the indefensible because it's indefensible that someone would have a private aircraft. He had, you know, net jets at the time, right? And we had a couple of private aircraft at Lucadia, and so we had this offsite in Telluride, Colorado. I don't know if any of you have ever been in Telluride, but their airport is up on a mesa. And so as you fly into the airport, it's like a cliff that you're flying into, and then you land on this little short runway, and when you take off, you take off and you actually drop off the cliff. It's really kind of exciting if you want something exciting. And uh, so we were there. We'd been there Thursday, Friday. We were having conversations. Warren flew in on Saturday and spent a little bit of time uh, with him that day. I got to kind of listen to him talk and just kind of sit at his knee and listen and learn. And then we had a meeting where we had our uh, executive team and him. 
And he obviously doesn't have kind of day-to-day -day anything with Berkadia because he's got a lot of other things he's worried about, but he sat there for like an hour and grilled our CEO and asked just like the most pertinent, important questions and just concise and really insightful and, and is, kind of, is kind of the person that, that you see on TV in, in some levels that way. Um, and anyway, so we kind of do that and then we go and we have a little mixer, a little social mixer over in the bar area. And we had the people's spouses there. And so there were about 20 people in the room and everyone had a name tag on, right? Hi, my name is whatever. And he was going around the room and he was posing for pictures and selfies and having all sorts of fun. And, and, uh, and then he looks down and he's wearing a little red sweater. He looks down and he says, well, where's my name tag? And we're like, well, yeah, we didn't think we needed to get you a name tag for you. He's like, oh, nonsense. And he runs over and writes, you know, hi, my name's Warren, peels it off, sticks it on his sweater. I mean, you know, kind of, the, kind of that persona. And then we had a dinner. And Telluride's a daylight airport, which means, you know, you have to take off before, a, I think it's either a half hour after or a half hour before sunset, whatever it is. And I burned into my skull is the idea he had to be take off by 8 o'clock at night. So I'm kind of watching the clock and we're having a dinner and and he's eating, and I'm sitting across the table from him, and I'm looking at, keep looking at my watch, and looking at him, looking at my watch, and he knows as I'm looking, and he's like, you know, it's about seven o'clock. He's like, oh, you know, Justin, this is okay, don't worry about it. And I keep looking, and he keeps eating, and I keep looking, and it gets to be about seven fifteen, and I'm starting to sweat a little bit. And he says, uh, and I said, I said, Warren, I, I think we ought to go. And he says, I'm not going anywhere without my ice cream. So two scoops of vanilla ice cream, chocolate sauce, cherry, cherry coke. He sits there, he's eating, I'm watching, he's eating, everyone's watching. He's drinking, I'm watching. He's rattling the thing in the cup. He's licking it, looking at me, laughing, winking. And about 7.40, he says, I think we gotta go. I'm like, oh man, we gotta go. So we jump out and we run and jump in a Suburban. I'm driving and he's in the passenger seat and two of his people are behind me and we're going up there. And to get up to the airport, it's kind of this windy road to get to the airport and, and some switchbacks and then you, you come out and I'm going a little bit faster than I should and it's starting to get dark and I'm pretty stressed out about it. And I come around an inside corner going too fast and standing in the middle of the road is a herd of elk, all right? And so what do I do? You know, I slam on the brakes because I don't want to hit a herd of elk, and I'm a dad, and what do dads do when they slam on the brakes? Stick their hand out like this, right? <laughs> so I'm driving, I slam on the brakes, I stick my hand out like this, Warren kind of goes like that, I'm holding on this, and two things happen simultaneously in my head. One is I can see the headline of the Wall Street Journal the next day, which is like idiot farm kid from Idaho, kills you know, the oracle from, of, of <laughs> Omaha, by hitting a herd of elk in Telluride, Colorado. I mean, that would have, could you see the headline? I would have been, it would have been awesome. At some level, and the second one is, wait a minute, I'm holding on to Warren Buffett's chest right here. <laughs> so I kind of look over and he kind of looks at me, he's like, oh, that was close. I'm like, that was close. <laughs> I shifted down into first gear. We like kind of work our way through the herd. And when those tail lights took off, it was one of the best moments uh, of my life. Um, uh, and one other thing I will say is, when he went to fly in, he was on a NetJets uh, jet, and they wouldn't land because the wind in the Telluride uh, area is kind of tricky, and the pilots didn't want to chance it. Imagine you're with Warren Buffett, you probably don't want to chance it. Uh, so they said, you know what, Warren will just land in Montrose, and he'll take a taxi to Telluride, which is an hour and 15 minutes. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, in Colorado, you're going to imagine the kind of taxi you're going to get from Montrose to Telluride. Warren Buffett's going to be riding it. So we sent over one of our planes to pick him up, and they picked him up and brought him back. The next year, he bought his own private plane, and he called it in his annual report, instead of the indefensible, it's now the indispensable. So we were part of the, part of the indispensable story. Uh, and uh, luckily, he's still alive. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about is one of the things about working with a, with a Berkshire uh, company, the idea of integrity is really important. Because as, I, as, as we look at Berkadia, and look, we're a decent-sized company, and we're having a pretty successful time, but you could multiply our results by 20, and it wouldn't even be a rounding error for him. So really from a monetary perspective, a return perspective, we're not driving a lot of value towards Berkadia, or sorry, towards Berkshire Hathaway, or frankly to Lucadia, which is now merged into Jefferies, um, but we can really tear things down. Like there's a lot of downside, and mostly it's around reputation. And Warren has a famous saying that you kind of, you'll see in his quotes, which is, you know, it takes, it takes many, many years to build a reputation, it takes five minutes to lose it. When I kind of got the job as the CEO of the company, that was kind of the message to me, which was, you know, don't screw it up essentially, but it was, you know, we can handle, we can take mistakes, we can take issues, we can take a, a downturn, we can take a lot of different, we can take problems, but what we can't take is a hit to our reputation. And so we're in an industry, as I just described to you, where we have 300 people who only eat if they kill. And on the other side, we're owned by someone who says, you know, the reputation is job number one. 
that's not automatically like, does not go together super well. And so as, as kind of I took the, the helm of the company, one of the things we decided is we've got to kind of have a true north. Like what's going to be our true north? And I've never been really a vision and a values guy kind of thing. I've more been like you're either a good person or you're not a good person kind of thing. Um, but we really decided we needed something to rally behind. So we spent a lot of time thinking about a vision. Like what do we want to be and how do we want to do it? So it's not just, it's not just important what we do. I mean, what we do is interesting and it's, you know, it's a process and we do all these sorts of things to make ourselves a better company. But how we do it is actually just as important. And so we kind of came up with this vision at Bercadia, we're redefining the industry with long-term investments in people and technology that deliver actionable insights and create the best possible client experience. There's a couple of things that are really interesting there. One is redefining the industry, and I could, I could talk ad nauseum about, you know, kind of this sleepy industry that, uh, that we compete in and how we can, things we can do with technology, things we can do uh, to make our business better. Lots of processes. We're a really process-heavy company, right? Lots of little, you got to do this and check this box, check this box, check this box, check this box. Lots of compliance, regulation, right? All sorts of stuff that we have to do. But there's, there's a real lot of opportunities for automation and improvement. But it ends up being far more of a people and a change management exercise than it is technology. A lot of people want to say, oh, you know, we'll just automate things, we'll make it better. It doesn't work if people don't believe in it and people aren't willing to change. And I was part of this group one time, it was a group of about 25 men and we were, we were standing around and we were, uh, uh, one, the guy who was kind of leading the discussion said, hey, can I just ask in this room, how many of you want to get better? And out of 25 people, how many would you guess raise their hand? How many people want to get better? All 25, right? And they said, okay, I got another question for you. Put your hands down. How many of you want to change? Not one hand went up. We're funny as human beings where I do think we have this idea that we want to get better, but we don't want to change to do it. And at our company where we've been, it's been kind of this train wreck of, you know, GMAC to Capmark to bankruptcy to... Bercadia now to growing to all to having all these high intensity high octane salespeople, um, it's very difficult to um, uh, to get better without changing, and it's very difficult to change. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about how do I help people change? How do I help people kind of see a vision? I'm not a commercial real estate expert, but really it's about how do we get our organization to to uh, to better service our clients? So we kind of came up with this vision. Uh, interesting part here: the word people before technology is important. important. Um, it's far more important that we change our people than we change our technology, and I believe that's true in every case. And then we talked about our values, and so we kind of established, okay, that's great, here's what we're going to do, here's what our kind of north star is, if you will. We're going to be working towards redefining our industry, but how are we going to do it? And we spent a lot of time on kind of these words, like, you know, what is really important to how we do things? What are the things that we want to be known for? What is it about our reputation? What is it, you know, as we think 10 years into the future, what is that, what do we want people to say about Bercadia? if they've done business with us or if they've run across us. And we kind of came up with these really starting with, and you can understand why starting with integrity is everything, right? Very, very important that we as financial fiduciary, fiduciarily, I'm gonna try that word, responsible uh, ent enterprise, we need to be, have integrity. Once we lose that, once something happens where we lose that, we lose, uh, we lose our business model. We take the long view, we're owned by Berkshire Hathaway and Lucadia. Berkshire never sells anything. Lucadia would rather die than lose their partnership with Berkshire Hathaway. And so we're planning on being around for 10, 20, 30, 40 years in the state we're in. We can make investments today that some of our competitors who are public or maybe they're a bank or maybe they're both, they have to kind of obey these short-term kind of demands from their shareholders. I worked for a public company for 14 years and you have these weird things happen with public companies. They're called earnings calls. And so every quarter you get on an earnings call and you have a bunch of 22 to 27 year old analysts who are on this phone call, it's a conference call, and you're explaining your results and then they're telling you how you should change and run your business. And you have to debate it. Now, well, why don't you diversify into that? Well, you have, but you have to be nice. And so you find yourself, it's kind of a creative exercise where you're like, how do I really nicely tell these people that they don't know what they're talking about? You spend a lot of time doing that. We're not a public company, and so we kind of have this opportunity where we can focus on driving the business, and we don't have to worry about kind of every quarter someone checking up on us. So we can make investments today that may not pay off for a year, two years, three years, four years down the road, but they're things that our competitors can't do. Um, people matter. This is a people business. Um, we stand for excellence. We love our jobs. And we just added we innovate, just because it used to say we're curious. Um, but we actually changed it to innovate because curiosity without execution is is not much uh, in a business setting or in life. 
Uh, one other thing that we did was kind of interesting is we, we spent a bunch of time de defining what we called the Bercadia Way. And, uh, and the Bercadia Way is just, once again, kind of a codification of our values and our vision, but also how does that happen on a one-on-one -on -one way? Like the next time I have a phone call, how am I going to interact with that person so that I, what I'm accomplishing my result in a way that impacts that other person positively? And so this has been multiple, you know, <laughs> There's been a lot of money and a lot of time. It's actually a class that I teach personally and, and uh, the rest of my management team does. And so, you know, I've, I think I've facilitated 27 five-hour sessions across the country and in India to kind of get this going. And it's really about how are we going to treat other people so that we can, we, can, we can succeed in our goals and they can succeed in theirs. And it's amazing in life how many people you run into that are solely focused on their own goals. It's a big, it happens a lot, and I'm sure that's not surprising to you in college as you think about uh, the competition and other people you're going, but the ability to kind of change and function as a team uh, is, a, is a powerful ability, and in our industry, which used to be, you know, populated by very lone wolf type, you know, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me getting that sale, it's all about me getting that listing, it's all about that, the client base is changing where what they want, they don't want transactions, they want solutions and they have problems. They don't have, here, here's a deal, do it. They have, I have 10 properties and I don't know what the heck to do. What do I do with all my 10 properties? They want someone who can come in and kind of comprehensively solve their problems and one person alone can't do that. You need kind of the power of the team. And I actually think this is one where it's a generational thing which is, you know, your group, kind of your cadre, your age group are actually far more naturally collaborative and naturally team-minded than prior generations. And it, you know, a lot of people spend a lot of time picking on the new generation. And if you want me to, I'll pick on it a little bit, but I, I can say some very good things, and that's one of the things I think you guys have a huge advantage is kind of being able to see yourself as part of a team. Um, it's more natural to you than it was certainly um, a couple generations ago. Um, I kind of like this. I was looking at Utah State's website and found kind of the, you know, the learning discovery engagement. It's a little bit like that. A similar kind of thing what we're trying to do at Bercadia with what, uh, what's trying to be taught and, and mentored here at Utah State. So let's talk about my journey. This is kind of fun, uh, and maybe we'll spark a couple of questions. So I grew up in this little town called Ryrie, Idaho. You know, it's about 60 miles west of Jackson Hole. It's Nowheresville, although I could probably play a game. I call it Six Degrees from Kevin Bacon. We could probably go in this room, and we could find six, you know, in six, within six relationships of you, you either have a family or you have someone you know from Ryrie. It's a, it's a cultural hotbed, um, a DNA hotbed, I guess. Uh, and then I, uh, in 1990, graduated. I came to Utah State. Uh, took a couple of years in between there to serve a, a, a church mission. Uh, came back, graduated, got married at Utah State, which is fantastic. Um, and then uh, went. To, my wife got accepted to a uh, physical therapy program at the U. And so we went down to Salt Lake, and I worked for a couple of different companies, just trying to keep the bills paid. Um, I'll take a funny aside. The reason, that, you know, one of the things that really drove me to Utah State was I, I got a scholarship. And I remember my dad, we were dry farmers. This is, the, this is kind of the, uh, the poor part of the farmers. No potatoes for us. We were the guys that watched the guys with, who had potato farms drive by in their new pickups, right? And I remember, I, clear as a bell, I was like 16 years old, and we were, I was sitting with my dad, and we were in the car, and we were driving over to where we had this beautiful 320 acres of fall wheat. It was spectacular. My dad was, you know, we're taking pictures. We were the selfies of our day, you know, we were taking those. And a, and a cloud came over and a hailstorm happened right on our farm and just knocked it all to the ground. And my dad and I were sitting in the pickup watching this happen and I remember I kind of looked at him and he looked at me and kind of got a little tear in the side of his eye and we drove off and instead of getting the combine, we went and got the tractor and plowed it under. And that was the moment where I was like, I am not gonna farm <laughs> if it kills me. So I got six generations of farms going up like this and hit me and it's like, no way, uh, no more farming. Um, and decided to, go, decided to go to college and came to Utah State and was uh, grateful for that opportunity. Uh, in Salt Lake, I worked for a couple different places to keep the lights on and settled on a place called, if any of you have heard of it, Mrs. Fields Cookies. It's actually one of the most recognized brands in the world. Unaided recognition over 90%. It was in bankruptcy because this was about the same time as this, this diet that was called the Atkins diet came out, which is a high protein, low uh, carb diet. Exactly the opposite of everything we were pimping at Mrs. Fields Cookies. Uh, and so I went into bankruptcy, and, uh, and my job was to go around and break real estate uh, lease agreements. So like we'd be in a mall next to JCPenney or whatever, or Sears, we'd have this 10-year uh, uh, lease with them and it had escalating rents, right? It went up like 10% every year, and JCPenney was like going out of business, Sears was going out of business, and pretty soon we were in malls where we were the only store. And very few people at that time were driving 
you know, and parking and going into a big empty building to get a cookie. Um, I did gain 30 pounds during the experience as I was the, I was the trier of the cookies. Um, and so, uh, but it was, a, it was kind of a tough experience for me. And I remember I got a, uh, uh, there was a job internally that got posted and I remember I applied for the job, it was in the finance area. Um, and I was told, you can't have that, we can't even look at you because you don't have an advanced degree. And at my, at my very core, I'm, a, I'm slightly competitive. And I was like, that'll be the last time I ever hear that. So I decided to go to business school. And so I went to business school in Happy Valley, uh, otherwise known as Provo. Um, graduated in, in 2000 and went to work for this company called Lucadia. And Lucadia was this wonderful place for me. I have a little bit of ADD and it was this wonderful place. It was a public company, but it had like a private equity mentality. So we owned companies and we owned wineries, we owned um, plastics companies, timber companies, uh, auto dealership companies, beef processing companies, and, um, banks. I mean, you just kind of go down the list. I'm a super interesting guy for about five minutes on any topic because we had all this kind of stuff. And I spent my days kind of rotating on the phone from what's the price of polypropylene resin to, you know, what's the price for two by fours in, you know, the southeast and southern yellow pine to what's going on, you know, to, uh, to what score did we get on our last one, you know, wine that was put out. It was fantastic. It was wonderful for me. And how it was constructed was my day job was always overseeing companies, a company or companies. And then my night job was always M&A. Like, where are we going to find our next deal? So it was very much part of kind of this, what we used to call as junkyard dogs. I mean, we were deal junkies. We were looking for the next deal and always looking for kind of deep, deep value. And so our first, uh, our first deal that we did with Buffett was actually a company called Finova. And it was based in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. At the time, it was the largest corporate bankruptcy in the world. And they're, because their business model was this. It's a pretty cool one. Try this one on. They would borrow money from banks, and they would lend it to people who didn't qualify to borrow money from banks. Hmm. And then they just did it really big, right? And so, for instance, they had a huge, they had a $3 billion portfolio of airplanes, uh, and then we had 9-11. And the, you can imagine what a fleet of airplanes was worth after 9-11, not much, right? We took it out to the desert and like cut it up and, into scrap. Um, and anyway, it, it went through bankruptcy and we did that partnership with him. And we've done a couple of others, which kind of led to Burcadia in 2009, where we got, to, got together uh, on Capmark. And um, I actually, in Lucadia in 2013, we merged with an investment bank called Jefferies. And, I, and we shut down our Salt Lake operation. I moved out to New York in 2013 and then became the uh, CEO of Burkadia in 2015. So I've been out there for about six years. My oldest daughter was a sophomore in high school. Um, so I moved her from Farmington, Utah to New Canaan, Connecticut on her sophomore year. It was a very peaceful six to eight months because she wouldn't talk to me. Um, so if you really, you know, if you ever have a difficult time with a teenager, just move um, and then they won't talk to you. Uh, but, but now she looks back on and says it was a wonderful thing and even she might want to live out east. So. I guess time heals a lot of wounds. Um, some lessons. I thought it would be helpful to just kind of go through a couple of stories about uh, uh, that would be helpful in kind of what have I learned. You know, I, I consider myself one of the most lucky people on earth because I, I really got to spend a lot of time around really, really smart people. Certainly far better than I deserved to have and, and so far better than brain power that I had. I had a couple of really strong mentors. There was a, a, the, the person who was the chairman of Lucadia, was a, he passed away a couple of years ago. His name was Ian Cumming. Very, very wealthy man. Very, very smart. Very, uh, very crazy, uh, which, which, which kind of matched up well. Spent a lot of time with him, kind of knee to knee, learning at his knee about how he kind of thought about the world. Had a lot of experiences where I was put in charge of operations or in charge of companies where I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, including Burcadia, um, and, and that's been, certainly was kind of lucky. And I really do look at the, one of the things that I think is the key as I look back on my experience was I was willing to kind of do whatever. And I think if we're going to kind of go to where, you know, maybe where, uh, where Utah State and, 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 uh, and uh, students from Utah State have an advantage over your peer set and your competitive set is that. Is there, you know, are we willing to kind of do the, do the tough stuff? First, the first seven years I was at, uh, at Lucadia, I didn't have a title. It was like, I had like a Lucadia business card that had like my name on it. It's like, that was it. And it didn't matter. I didn't, I, I, didn't know there any, I didn't know any better. I hadn't been around business in my life. And a lot of times now when I'm interviewing people or we're interviewing people for jobs coming out of college, the first thing they want to ask is, what's my title? I'm like, your title is work. <laughs> 
we'll figure out what we're going to put on your business card as soon as we figure out if you can work, right? And I think there's a real opportunity for there. I want to go here to kind of the lessons learned at Utah State. So there were some really interesting things that happened. One was, I, as I said, I'd never been exposed to business. And I walked by the hall today the, the, on the first floor of, I guess, what's now called the, is it called the tower or something like the business tower or whatever it was? That was, the business, that was the business building when I was here. And the first floor had a conference, or a, 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 sorry, a teaching room. It was a, I think it was the biggest at the time. And I had, I don't know, you could probably fit 120 students or something in there. And I took a Econ 110. And I took it from a guy named Reed Durchy. And that, I would not ever seen anyone who had the passion about kind of his subject like, uh, like Professor Durchy did. And it ignited something. He was from Driggs, Idaho, so maybe there's a little bit of kinship there uh, that I had. But he just started talking and explaining and had this really kind of excitement and, and energy about economics that just really, really caught me. And, and you, do, you do notice that about people, is people who are passionate about what they do are like magnets, and they attract people who are around them. And uh, that was kind of a good lesson for me and had a very good time. I learned a couple of other really funny lessons, and I'm going to talk about one now, and there's actually kind of a, a, a slow and special in here in the room. It's Dr. Paul Randall is here. He was, my, he was my corporate finance professor, and i got to tell you a story about it. So it was the hardest class in the program, and everyone knew about it. Very rigorous. You were doing, you know, compound interest calculations by hand. I mean, this was like tough stuff, right? Very, very difficult. And so we were getting ready for the final. And in these days, in the old library, you could go to the library and you could find a, a, a bunch of like old tests that professors had done and, and classes had had. And so I went, and as everyone did, and went and looked at all the tests, reviewed all these tests. And at the time, he would allow us to have one page. I think it was either a three by five card or it was maybe one front page of a paper. You could bring that in with any notes that you wanted and you could take the final. So I was like, I was sweating through this thing because, you know, I, while I graduated in finance, you know, I'm not, it's not, uh, it, it's, I still had to work at it. And so I was working away, working away, working away. And I was back in the library and we were looking through all these tests, all these old tests, all these old tests. And I found folded up in the very back of the folder that had all the tests in it, this one test. And it had all the concepts that were on it. So I was like, hey, that's kind of cool. Let me just take that. And I actually took the test and I had the answers to it so you could kind of work through it. I took it and I copied that kind of line by line onto my sheet of paper, sheet of paper daily. But oh, it looks pretty good. That pocket. Walked into class the next day. Lays the test out. I pull up the test. It's like, it's the test. It's on my paper. So I kind of, it had a few numbers changed, but it was kind of tested. So I got done, I got done in like 20 minutes. And I walked up to Professor Randall, and I handed my test in to him after like 25 minutes. And he took it, and he looked at it, and he said, get out of here. Get out. And I was like, I was like, no, no, no. He's like, no, get out of here. <laughs> and I got an A. So thank you, <laughs> Professor Randall. So the thing that I learned, here's the thing that I learned. It was, the thing that I learned was not about... Once again, what you, in, 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 in a university, you'll learn a bunch of hard skills, but you'll also learn something I think that's very important in life is there's like, there are, and I call it with my kids, I call it the game. Play the game. The rules are what the rules are. Figure out what the rules are and play the game. And I learned a little bit about that, about kind of, you know, that there's, there's a game, there's, a, there's, 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 there's rules, there's kind of ways things need to go, there's opportunities that are given to you. Take advantage of those, figure it out. Don't just think about the assignment. Don't just think about the class. Don't just think about the subject. What's the game that's being played here? And one of the games that's being played at the university is teaching you about relationships and how to figure things out in a broader sense. It's not just about the subject. So if you come and you become a super, super duper finance person, with just those kind of hard skills, you've missed a huge opportunity. You've missed a huge opportunity, a larger community, but also just kind of being able to see problems with a little bit different vision. Let me give you another kind of funny example. So in, in 1995, um, I was a, the, let me see, student of the year in the College of Business. I did not deserve to be the student of the year in the College of Business. But the previous three years, we kind of had these people who were kind of very, 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 they just essentially took the smartest person. It was like the valedictorian of the business, of the business college is going, to be the, is going to be the student of the year. And so I had a couple of friends, a couple were from Logan, a couple of other people, and we were sitting around one time, we're like, well, we think that's not fair. That should be someone else. Like, we just think we ought to do it a little bit differently. So we're like, all right, which one of us has the best grades? Because it's got to be someone who has pretty decent grades. I had pretty decent grades. And, I was like, and so we kind of compare our, you know, well, I have a 3-4, well, I have a 3-6. Okay, great. Awesome. So, okay, Justin, we're going to actually, like, mount a campaign 
to see if we can figure out how to like, let's get someone else to be in the College of Business. So Scott, one of his name was Scott, he's like, hey, you know, my dad's best friend is, you know, the, a professor of whatever. Like, all right, okay, you gotta get that and talk, go tell them that, you know, Justin's a great guy. And we did, I mean, we did this whole little like behind the scenes thing. I won the award, I got crushed in the competition for the uh, university person because most of these people had like cured cancer and stuff like that. <laughs> but it kind of goes back once again, one of the things they kind of learn at the university is like there was a game there, there was a game to kind of be played of like, you know, what, what, what are the rules? How do we figure out how to get things done? How do I figure out in my job? How do I figure out my family? How do I figure out in my Boy Scout troop? How do I figure out in my, you know, whatever civic group I'm part of? What's the game? What is success? Define that and then figure out a strategy not trying to do it the way that I wanted to do it, not trying to do it maybe the way that kind of I thought the rules were, but the way that the, the way that the game was truly played. People who can see the way the game is truly played have a power over everyone else. And I learned a little bit about that at Utah State. I'm gonna do something weird because I was thinking about this last night. I'm gonna go kind of in backwards order here. The three major things that I learned over my career, and hopefully I can kind of use some stories. The first hard, then soft skills. When you come out of school, you will be hired for the value you can immediately accrete in a hard skill way. So focus on, for instance, if you were to come to Berkadia and you were going to be hired into our company out of undergraduate, you would go into an analyst role. An analyst role is a spreadsheet jockey. It is about crunching numbers. It's about you know, critical thinking analysis. It's about being able to bring in market research, being able to bring in other points of data. Where do they fit in as we're putting together a pro forma? All this kind of like hard skill stuff. Make sure as you leave the university, you have a hard skill that you can work into. Now, what's interesting about your career evolution is that hard skill actually, over time, becomes almost an anchor. Now, I, I, I'm going to say this in a little bit. I've got I to gotta make sure I check myself on that. You may find that, all you, that, that your passion is the hard skill. That's cool. Follow your passion. Be the hard skill person. If you want to move up in responsibility and specifically in management and leadership of people, your, your hard skill becomes an anchor because you're relying on that hard skill. You're relying on that hard skill and you're not pushing yourself on the softer skills which are really centered around people. I'll give you a great example. At Bercadia, our mortgage bankers um, are, are make right now in the cycle make a lot of money. I think we have 140 mortgage bankers and 70 of them, 70 something of them made over a million dollars last year. One guy made 13 million dollars last year, right? Lots of money. We, what we did traditionally in our industry is if you were a really great producer, we made you a leader. That is a disaster. Because what you need to be a really great producer is almost the opposite of what you need to be a manager and a leader of people. Hard charging, driving, you know, almost relentless kind of work ethic, staying up you know, until three in the morning, calling, phone, just, you know, just the relentlessness of it. That does not play well with people. It wears people out. And asking someone to shift from kind of this, you know, this, I'm the great producer to becoming a great leader, it actually just becomes a little bit too far. They've focused on their hard skills, on their selling skills, on their technical skills to sell this particular product. That was their choice. But if you want to kind of move up into leadership, and some of you may, some of you won't, you got to start to depend and you got to start to exercise those soft skills. So you're going to get hired for your hard skills, especially right out of school. But you gotta always be thinking about how can I kind of transition to those softer skills. Once again, if you wanna be in leadership, you may wanna just, if you're super good at your hard skills, you may wanna just continue to rely on that. Judgment and decisiveness. So I, I told you I was at Lucadia, and we actually had a, uh, in Salt Lake, we had a bank that we ran. It was a national association. It was kind of a really cool bank that had been done after the Glass-Steagall Act. It was really interesting. But what it truly was, was a subprime auto lending company. So people don't even say the word subprime anymore because it became such a swear word in 2008, but what it meant was people with super bad credit. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was called American Investment Bank, which I think is the world's best name for a bank. Ameri Doesn't that just like signify strength and power? And we're doing subprime lending. Um, and uh, we were there and, 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 and our, our uh, chairman, Ian Cumming, had actually founded the bank. And it was this, this really beautiful building on 200 East South Temple, in the back, it had a koi pond, it had trees he'd imported from China, it had wrought iron gates and a fountain, and on the wrought iron gates, there was actually a snake and an apple, if you looked really close, and he liked to call it the Garden of Ian. Oh. Garden of Ian. So this was his baby, right? And when I first came out of business school, he called me Jason for like the first couple of years I was there, which was, uh, which was good because I made a lot of mistakes and that Jason guy got a lot of heat. Uh, <laughs> 
And uh, we were, I was working at the bank, and one of the first things I was asked is, look, he said, the, the bank is losing profitability. I want you to go into the bank and kind of figure it out. I got there with a laptop. I didn't know what I was doing. Found a place, started typing in stuff, and looking at processes. And anyway, it became very obvious pretty quickly that the bank was, you know, risk, the risk was going up. We were seeing more losses, more delinquencies on our loans. The competitive pressure meant our pricing was going down, and we were starting to kind of, you know, profitability was going to become scarce, and the more volume we did, the worse it was going to get. Each loan that we made was going to lose a little bit more money. So we went in to have this big meeting, and Ian, we got into Ian's airplane, and, um, and the president of the bank, and my boss got in with me, and we flew off to New York to be, meet with Ian's partner. His name's Joe. And uh, I was, at the time, the spreadsheet jockey, like I was talking about. I was the guy with the data, and I knew where the lines crossed. I knew what was happening. I knew what was going to happen. And, and we all agreed as we got on there, when we meet with Ian and Joe, we were going to tell them they needed to shut down the bank. And so we're sitting there, and we got into the, the, the uh, boardroom at Lucadia, and I had this really interesting thing, which was Ian always sat at the head of the table, and it was a long table. And he always sat at the head, and behind him was this picture, it was a, it was a painting, and it was of Brutus stabbing Julius Caesar. So every time you looked at the chairman of the company, you have this image of this guy like, Hur! right? And I was sitting at the very other end of the table, and I'm looking at Ian, and all I've got is like the spreadsheets, right? And I'm just kind of sitting there, the president of the bank's over here, Joe's over here, this guy named Bud Scruggs is sitting over here, and uh, I'm looking at them, and they start talking, and they said, hey, you know, we, we gave them a, you know, a little uh, PowerPoint slides, We're like, hey, here's what we kind of need to do, and Bud says, you know, Ian, I think what we need to do is we need to shut down the bank. And Ian says, can I ask you something? And Bud said, yeah. He said, uh, do you know what the garden's called? And Bud says, no. This is what I found out. It's called the Garden of Ian. This is my bank, and you want to shut down my bank? And Bud and Randy were both like, uh, oh, hey, you know, maybe what we could do, you know, maybe not shut down, but, you know, get smaller, maybe we can shut down, you know, start doing this. And so kind of the, the meeting kind of ends. We're just going to kind of slow down, slow down, uh, slow down uh, operations and originations. And I was just sitting there kind of watching this whole thing. I didn't say a single word because that wasn't my job. My job was to be the spreadsheet jockey, right? So I'm just kind of sitting there. And, and Ian looks down at me, and I'm at the end, and I don't know what happened, what exact look I had on my face, but he goes, What's that ugly look on your face, Jason? And I said, uh, I said, well, uh, I think we're making the wrong decision. And it, like the room goes, everyone sits down, and he says, well, why don't you tell me about that? And I said, you know, you look at page whatever, you look at page twelve. This is what's happening. If you want to lose more money because it's the Garden of Ian, okay, but let's just not pretend that we're not going to lose money. And he says, jumps up and said, he, was a, he had a very uh, expansive vocabulary. If you say the F word, it's an expansive vocabulary. <laughs> and he said, uh, he, said, he, said, he said, Jason, I don't care what you guys do. If you shut down, I'm still going to be rich. I'm going home. And he jumps out of his chair, and he just storms off. And I'm sitting there going, oh. <laughs> this is about a year and a half into my time at Lucadia. I was like, oh. And, my, and Joe, who's his partner, jumps up and follows him. And so I'm sitting there with Bud and with Randy, and we're looking at each other, and they're like, and they're kind of like, ooh, you know, that probably wasn't the best career move. We kind of had this meeting done. We were ready to go. We were safe. And I said, uh, and I was just kind of sitting there going, why did I open my mouth? Why did I open my mouth? So Joe comes back in, and he says, hey, Justin, can I talk to you in my office? Oh, gosh. So it's, you know, if you've ever seen Dead Man Walking, it's like Dead Man Walking. I'm walking behind him. We go into his office. He says, do you want to take a seat? And I'm like, no, I, I think I'll take this standing. I'm thinking, I've got to get out of you know, i got to escape as soon as I get fired. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the other thing I was thinking, I was like, Ian got, took the plane. I wonder if they're going to pay for me to get home. <laughs> or I'm just going to have to, like, you know, how am I going to do this? I might have to start hitchhiking. So anyway, I just, he, he says, he says uh, Justin, I've got, got to tell you something. I said, what's that? He said, we need more people doing that telling the truth, even if it's unpopular. Now, it's nothing, I honestly don't know why I did it. I mean, I wish I could say I was always like looking for opportunities to be the truth teller, but I will say one thing, because of my hard skills. And because at some level, and I don't know, you know, I've tried to figure it out in my life. One of the things like, have you ever been, you know, I'll just use, a, use an example. I played sports in high school. I was terrible. I was not great. I was not great at anything. But if there was two seconds left in the game with like, we were down one point, I wanted the ball. There's like that little nugget of just like wanting to make a decision. And what I've found in most, in most of my experience is at the end of the day, most people don't want to make a decision. They want someone else to make the decision they want to follow. And if you, want to, if you really want to get ahead in life, and you really want to make yourself stand out, 
develop judgment and decisiveness. Judgment is making decisions and making bad decisions and making decisions and learning from them and experience and those sorts of things. Get yourself some judgment. Get yourself able to make a good decision. My, my, uh, my, one of my other mentors told me, um, if you're, a gr if you're uh, one of the best managers of all time, 50% of your decisions will be good. If you're really good, you just work really hard to make sure the 50 that are bad don't end up too bad. And I think that's really true. And then once you have that judgment, be willing to be the person who makes the decision. I, I, I was actually part of a cohort that was brought into Lucadia. I had someone from, I had two people from Harvard Business School, I had a person from Northwestern, I had a person from, person from Northwestern, I had another person from, uh, I think it was from MIT or Stanford, one of the two, and me. And they were all, all of them were smarter than I, and they still are smarter than I am. For sure, for sure, for sure. The one thing that I can kind of point to is that none of them wanted to make that last decision. Because that last decision is where the risk is. It's got high, high risk, high reward kind of thing, but it's really, really powerful. And so I encourage you, and I think Utah State has a great opportunity to develop students who are decisive, who are willing to kind of make that decision and stand on it. And it's, it's really, really a powerful thing. And you don't have to do it that many times. I can look back in my career and there's like seven of them where I'm like, that was a time where like, it was a watershed moment where a decision needed to be made with 30% of the data that needed to be made, that we had, that needed to be made to make that decision. And uh, but sometimes at some point you just have to make one and live with, the, live with the, and people will rally around that when they see someone who's decisive. So judgment and decisiveness. And then this last one, honest, hardworking, and smart. So I remember I was talking, once again, I told you about Ian. Oh, one, one other uh, kind of funny aside that's actually influenced my life. I was sitting with him one time, and he had, he had a fleet of airplanes. He had a house in Jackson, Salt Lake, Snowbird, you know, Southampton, overlooking the UN Gardens. He had, you know, you know those boxy G-Wagon Mercedes. He had like four silver ones of those. I mean, the guy was like, he had everything. I just was, was so amazed by him. And uh, I was sitting with him one time, and I said, Ian, you got all this stuff. You got all this stuff. Why, you know, um, what, is there ever anything that you're not happy about? Like, what, what, would I, what could possibly make you upset? And he turned to me and he said, that's a good question, inconvenience. And when I first heard that, I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> You're just pushing me off. But as I've thought about that and as I've had more and more of life's experiences and you think about the client experience, it's actually the key. People will pay more for convenience than they will for lots of other things. And it's not just about the price. It's not just, it's the value that they see in the convenience. The honest hard work smart, just sorry to kind of finish on, on this and we can get to kind of probably the end. Are we out of time? No, we've got time for questions. Time for questions, okay. Honest, hard working, and smart. I once asked Ian, I said, Ian was kidding me about my upbringing because he loved to talk about the fact I was a farm kid. He loved to, he actually loved to talk about the fact I went to Utah State. He'd always call me his Aggie. He's like, here's my Aggie, right? Here's my Aggie. Got my Aggie here. I got, my, these, I got a whole pile of guys from, you know, Harvard, but I got my Aggie over here. Um, and, uh, and I'd say to him, I'd say, because I'd, I'd say, Ian, I don't know, you know, this is awesome. Why, you know, what was, was there anything I did, you know, how to, and he says, Justin, my mantra for people who are going to be successful is this, honest, hardworking, and smart in that order. And then he went on to tell me, why is it that order? Well, if you're not honest, but you're hardworking and smart, you're freaking dangerous. Who in the heck would want a really hardworking, smart person who's dishonest? That's a, there could not be damage done, more damage done by someone, right? So that honest, hardworking, and smart mantra has stayed with me, and it's actually part of our hiring process. As we interview people and talk to them, we have questions that are specifically designed to find out, are people honest, hardworking, and smart, and is it in that order? Where will their priorities go? Do they need to be seen as the smartest person in the room, and will they give up their integrity to do it? You know, when it comes to cutting corners for, for upside, will they do that? And if we can kind of get the people who are honest and hardworking and smart in that order, we can make them successful. And I think that's another place where obviously the, the standards of Utah State, and I think my kind of uh, time here certainly helped me on that. So lots of stuff. Sorry for the speed round and the spewing. Um, we'll open it up now for questions, Haley. Is that right? Thanks for coming. My name is Andrew Fender. I'm studying finance and accounting. I've really loved hearing you talk today. Several times you've mentioned that integrity has been completely key to everything uh, that has happened in your career. And I was wondering if you might be able to talk about a time uh, at Bercadia 
where it was hard to make that right decision, uh, what some of the fallout was from that decision, uh, both positive and negative, if you could. Yeah, a, a, a great question. Uh, I'll say this. So we had, uh, when, I, when we brought Burkadia together, I talked about the investment sales side. We had one particular producer who was kind of 3x as good as anyone else in our network. So he did, you know, over a billion dollars of investment sales himself. So we have 100 people doing eight, and he was doing one himself. I mean, that's very, very powerful. The guy did not do his business correctly. And we actually drew this diagram, which is kind of a, a, a you know, diagram that was like your uh, values and your production. And we did a little four square. And if you had low values and low production, why are you here? You know, if you have high values and high production, that's what we want. If you have high values and low production, we can coach you. And then we have what I call the zone of management courage, which is like, what do you do with someone who has great production but no values? And so we drew it up there. We put names on everyone. We stuck it up there. And there was one guy who was like off the charts of production and on the very left end of, of uh, values. And we just stared at it for like a week. And I, and I, and, and I was with my management team. And we, we were going through some rocky times. And we were coming out to this bankruptcy. We had a bunch of kind of stuff that was facing us. And we sat there for a week. And we just kept sitting there. And we'd come in every day. And we'd have a meeting. And that was sitting on the whiteboard behind us. And finally, the guy who headed my production said, I've got to take care of this, don't I? I said, I don't know. It depends on what we want to do as a company. Who do we want to be? He's like, I'll fly out tomorrow. Fly out tomorrow and let the guy go. Now, it kicked a hole in our financial boat for a little bit. But I'd go back and say in Southern California now is one of the greatest spots we have in our company. But that took, like, that was, are we going to do, integrity is great as a concept. In practice, it can be really hard. But it pays off in my experience anyway. Awesome. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. One more great So my name's April. I'm actually the recruiter for the Huntsman School. So we have a group of high school students here who are all kind of ready to make the decision of where they're going to go to college, what they're going to major, and all of that. I was just wondering if you could maybe give them some advice on how to kind of follow your passions and maybe how to make a decision on where they want to go to school and maybe what they want to major in and all of that. Is it even a question? <laughs> Holy cow. Gosh. Go to Utah State. Um, I, here's just what I'd say. I, you heard a little bit of my background. I didn't, get, I didn't have exposure to business. So I would just, what, the thing that I would say about finding your passion is just make sure you get a lot of exposure to stuff. Different people, different cultures, different opportunities, different, you know, uh, you're, you have parents, you have friends. Like, the, you know, go, go mirror someone for a day. Ask someone, hey, can I, let me talk to your dad or your mom. Can I go, like, spend a half day with them and just see what the heck it is they do? Maybe they're a nurse, maybe they're a doctor, maybe they're a lawyer, maybe they're in business, maybe they're a farmer, who knows? Just get yourself as much exposure as you possibly can to different things. And by the way, closing doors is just as important as opening them. If you say, like for me, I, if I see blood on myself or anyone else, I'm out like a light. That's a good thing to know. I, I was never tempted, I didn't have to worry about spending a bunch of time, like am I gonna be a doctor? No, not gonna happen, can't do it, right? Those sorts of things though, I have a, my, my one daughter did a business internship her, after her freshman year of college. She hated it. It's good to know, right? I, wasn't, I was bummed a little bit because I think business is really cool, but the fact that it's not for her is a great thing for her. She can now focus her time on other areas and getting exposure, so I think that's really kind of part of it. The decision one is, you know, that's a, that's a harder one. I think it's, part of it is really, you know, um, I had an opportunity to go to a different business school, it was, uh, you know, it was a higher ranked, I'll say, business school, and it kind of came down to this weird thing, which was like, do I want to be a bigger fish in a smaller pond or a smaller fish in a bigger pond? And I actually like the idea of being a bigger fish in a smaller pond, but it's just me. And so part of my decision of where I went to business school was that. And so there's, some, there's just some, some things I think that are really personal to yourself. Know yourself and, and kind of get as much exposure as you can and make the best decision you can. And, and once again, remember, the best people only make 50% good decisions. You work really, 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 really hard on all your decisions, and they'll turn out okay. For sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. Can we give him a round of applause?